Does it look okay? Yep. Good to go. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate this and I'm fascinated by um, Lee's um, top-down approach and, and hoping that uh, as we put all the pieces together, we'll, we'll see how this applies in different settings. Um, I'm going to take a look at um, you know, the, the great big challenge of who all of the stakeholders might be and uh, see how they fit into a universal risk reduction framework. Um, moving from what we already have, which I'm calling a plan in practice. In other words, if, uh, if nobody's ever consciously set about to do disaster risk reduction, they've nevertheless been doing something. And um, so, so they've, I'm calling that a plan in practice and, and seeing how we can transition that to a conscious plan. And then moving beyond tokenism involving children and youth. So you know, we, we frequently say that uh, disaster risk reduction is everybody's business. And so when you enter the urban environment, of course, the everybody is just this you know, massive uh, group of, of people. And uh, how do we start to make sense of whether it's a million or 10 million? Of course, um, it, it helps the sociological literature um, often divides us into the micro, which is all the citizenry, the individuals, families, and households, the meso, which is how we organize ourselves socially, really, um, in neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, civic organizations, and businesses. And then the policy level where um, you know, national, regional, and local decisions um, are made collectively. And so um, that division, I think, helps us to conceptualize the issue of urban stakeholders. At the micro level, of course, we're talking about the individuals. And at the macro level, we're talking about policymakers in various settings, and, and Lee's example were the local councils especially. Um, and the place where it gets um, perhaps the, the most diverse and challenging is the meso level, where we're talking about public agencies, academic and scientific institutions, civilian organizations of many different kinds, businesses, opinion leaders that we rely upon, and of course international organizations come into that picture as well. And I mean, we we can go into you know further detail on these um, meso organizations. I'll, I'll come to how we um, a sort of laundry list of them in a bit. But the other sort of theoretical um, framework that I'd like to give this is to look at our disaster mitigation tasks in terms of these three parts. And this is kind of borne out by the research literature on both urban planning as well as on household and organizational adaptation to disaster risk reduction. The first area is assessment and planning. And I always uh, present those as though they were one word because we've seen clearly that doing assessment without planning or doing planning without assessment gives us no valuable results. And unfortunately, it's often the case that assessment and planning are undertaken by different groups of people, and they don't often come together very nicely. So, um, so I think by putting them together, we start to put the onus on making that part of the same process. The second area is physical protection. Sometimes I'd refer to this as physical and environmental protection. But this is really where the nitty gritty of disaster risk reduction takes place. And I'll go into a bit more detail on that. And then the third area is response capacity development. And I generally um, like to think of that as the backup plan that we put in place because our physical and environmental protection measures um, are usually insufficient. And so that's really just to pick up the slack of where we have so far failed in physical and environmental protection. Um, now, the advantage of this particular framework is that it works at the micro, meso, and macro level. And because I come from a grassroots um, community organization background, I'm frequently challenged by working with the general public. The general public doesn't usually like to hear a, um, a list of prescriptive things that they are supposed to do. They don't mind being part of the whole picture. Um, but what we frequently do when we, when we speak to the public is we, we give them a, a laundry list of things that, that they should do. Instead, I, I like to put it in terms of we are all doing all of these things. We're doing the assessment and planning. We're doing the physical and environmental protection. 
and we're developing the response capacity, whether we're doing it at home and in our families, at school or at work or in our neighborhoods or at the policy level, at any, uh, at any of our policy levels. Um, and I think that by helping people, helping all of our stakeholders to understand this, we give a uh, greater depth of meaning to disaster risk reduction in everybody's business. So I'm not going to be able to go into these details, but you can look at this later on. Um, in reviewing the literature, particularly the urban planning literature on disaster risk reduction, we can see that there are activities in assessment and planning that can take place at the micro, meso, and macro level. And these are very familiar activities to all of us. But it's just to kind of reinforce the, um, the value of this particular framework. And the same happens um, when it comes to physical protection. There are things to be done at each level. And the same with response capacity development. So I think these are probably familiar to most of our listeners, so um, I'm not going to go into any of those details. But I do want to give you an example of where we tried to put this framework into practice um, in the Central er Asia Earthquake Safety Initiative. And this is something that I did prior to um, beginning work, my work with Save the Children Australia. Um, so I'm going to just uh, give you a little bit of information about this uh, Geohazards International and USAID project that was conducted with a large group of uh, government and NGO partners in Central Asia between 2003 and 2004. The first thing that we did was to go in and to collect baseline data from a huge variety of stakeholders. So this was, in a sense, a due diligence and research phase, document collection review, structured interviews and questionnaires for key informants, brief surveys, small group stakeholder meetings amongst people who were familiar with one another in some of the different uh, stakeholder groups that I talked about, some case studies and some direct observation. And this was used to sort of put together um, an initial baseline report for, in this case, the city of Tashkent. So this gave the background in terms of a description of geographic, social, economic, political, and cultural environment, and a description of the known hazards. And then, in addition to um, the sort of narrative report, we basically put together a, a mapping, um, as it's now referred to, of initiatives and strategies and asked each of those organizations that felt that they were doing something in the area of disaster risk reduction to say what it was and uh, you know, give us the highlights of, of that initiative. Um, and this is what I'm referring to as the plan and practice. These, these folks actually you know, never, had never previously sat down together to fashion a plan and to give any coherence to what they were doing. They were all just doing their uh, their own projects in their own silos with whatever resources they could cobble together. But in fact, there were many, many, many of these. And once we started to look at our stakeholders as, um, as wide-ranging, um, once we were looking at academic and scientific institutions, um, professional associations, labor organizations, condominium owners associations, neighborhood councils, um, uh, student groups, service organizations, NGOs. It went on and on and on. And so in the city of Tashkent, I think we had um, something like 90 initiatives. Um, and, and that really enriched our understanding of what the potential was for urban disaster risk reduction. Once we started to acknowledge all of those small efforts uh, that were taking place within their own context. Um, then we sort of compiled that information and categorized it. So we had you know, people saying that they were doing all manner of things, but we wanted to see what was being done in assessment and planning, what was being done in physical and environmental protection, and what was being done in response capacity development so that we could better see the goals. And physical and environmental protection, and I think this one maybe fits very nicely with uh, Lee's chart that he showed us at the end. We actually divided the physical and environmental protection up into structural, non-structural, infrastructural, and environmental. And the structural, as you might imagine, concerned 
existing um, buildings and uh, new construction as well. The non-structural um, concerned building contents, machinery, um, and uh, in, in the case of Tashkent, of course, we were looking at earthquake hazards, so that takes on um, special relevance as far as protecting the population within the buildings, as well as protecting critical infrastructure. Infrastructural, concerning all of the uh, lifeline infrastructure and so forth, and environmental. And then we um, also looked at, separately, response skills as well as response provisions. And again, for each level, micro, meso, and macro. So we would have, in other words, there were three parts to the whole report, the micro, the meso, and the macro sections of the report. And for each of those levels, we also looked at the strategic parameters, the concerns and goals, the norms um, that we found locally and how we described them, the applicable laws and policies for each level, the responsible government agencies, and then a kind of modified SWOT analysis with weaknesses and threats, strengths and resources, a delineation of the stakeholders and their possible roles, and, and then it just a cross-reference to the strategies that were already being used. We used that um, baseline report to circulate to a very wide-ranging group of these stakeholders and invited these, um, especially the organizations, to send representatives to the first of what was to be an annual two-day urban uh, disaster risk reduction planning event. Um, when we got there, we broke into um, the, the agenda, into the spheres of action. So we started off with assessment and planning, and then we went to physical and environmental protection, and then we went to response capacity development. And uh, we broke into uh, smaller groups and reviewed the norms, evaluated the priorities, discussed collaboration. And that led to some formation of action groups across the silos. So it was very interesting. We just you know, allowed people to voluntarily break themselves up into groups. And so we had separate groups meeting on um, structural safety, non-structural safety, uh, infrastructure safety, and um, um, what was my fourth one? <laughs> um, let's me head back there. Um, and environmental protection, excuse me. Um, and as a result of that discussion, uh, and putting all of this up uh, in a matrix or around the walls of a room, um, there was a great deal of interest generated in both information sharing so that people started to recognize where the capacities and strengths already lay and where many initiatives had already begun and things could be expanded, where the expertise in, this, in the urban environment lay and who could go to whom for more support. They also then collectively began to see the gaping holes and then were able with you know, different colored pens to kind of start going around and identifying what it is that needed to be done. And then in the subsequent session, as people moved around, uh, the participants were able to start prioritizing and highlighting and putting stars next to the things that they thought were the most important activities to be undertaken. So what that did, that opportunity for information sharing, networking, relationship building, cross-sectoral collaboration, developing new initiatives, and, it, and also assisting donors and funders in identifying worthwhile and feasible projects because there was so much energy generated in the course of, of this um, event that it was very clear um, what kind of uh, synergies were starting to emerge. And theoretically, the next steps would be uh, to have a secretariat for a group like that um, or leadership from a consortium or from a municipal DMO and so forth. Uh, to have ongoing action planning groups, to have a periodic review, and to repeat a meeting like that, uh, say, every couple of years. So, um, I mean, I know I've zipped right through that, but hopefully we'll be able to come back in the discussion session um, to, um, to make some additional sense of it. Um, but that's, that's really, I think, a process that would be applicable um, 
for just about any city where comprehensive disaster risk reduction planning had not yet taken place. And it's kind of a combination of a top-down and bottom-up um, approach. It's an urban application, I would say, of some of our traditional um, um, community vulnerability and capacity assessment um, approaches. I also um, want to mention among our, our urban stakeholders um, a group that needs special consideration and um, some special efforts to include. And at the time that we did the uh, project in Tashkent, I was not as sensitized as I am now to that, and we didn't do a very good job of it. Uh, but why child participation? Uh, I think that we're we're all aware that we're doing this for uh, for the future. We're doing this for our children, and um, we have clearly, I think, demonstrated in the last 10 years that children have played an important role in risk reduction and response. They play an important role in information sharing. They are eager to be involved. Um, they often are um, provide the, the energy and uh, the inspiration um, to get things done. Uh, the how of child participation, um, I think, is, is not as complex as perhaps it sounds. Uh, we can mobilize existing school-based, neighborhood-based, and youth groups. There's no need to start a whole new organization. Um, there are um, many places where uh, children gather. We don't have to have uh, whole new activities either. We can join into sporting events and community events and festivals and, and uh, so on. Uh, we do, of course, always want to be very um, transparent and encourage informed consent. We want to have opportunities to participate. Um, and where participation has to be limited, we want a transparent and a democratic selection process. Ideally, young people can select their own representatives um, and uh, do a good job at that. Um, and we also want to make sure that we have some child and youth oriented introductory sessions so they know what they're getting involved in and, and we can tailor it to their um, needs and understanding. Um, something that we've seen has been very effective as far as child participation is special briefings with municipal leadership. And uh, wherever it's been done, the municipal leadership and policymakers are delighted to have the input of uh, young people. Um, I think also field trips, speakers, video interviews with a range of stakeholders, HBCA and TownWatch are all uh, very valuable uh, approaches to be used in the urban setting. And of course, wherever possible, facilitating um, some innovative action projects and, and giving them the, the kind of uh, prominence that they deserve. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. 